Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Talking Foreign Affairs with Ado. This is a series where I take an interesting perspective through interviewing key figures in the arena of foreign affairs and diplomacy. My name is Adel Carter, the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Ambassador for Western Australia. Joining us today, I'm extremely honored and lucky to be having a distinguished guest on the show, whose illustrious career I'm sure will provide for an exciting discussion, the Honorable John Howard. John Howard was Prime Minister of Australia from 1996 to 2007, making him the country's second longest serving Prime Minister. Under his government, Australia led the UN sanctioned force following East Timor's vote for independence. His government strengthened bilateral ties between Australia and many nations in Asia. In 2012, he was appointed a member of the Order of Merit in recognition of his contribution to public service. In addition to general foreign affairs, we will also be talking about the power of sports as a diplomatic tool, something else that Mr. Howard is extremely experienced in, given that under his time in office, the Prime Minister's 11 have won the most cricket matches than any other Prime Minister. Mr. Howard joins us from his office in Sydney. Mr. Howard, welcome to the show. Welcome, and thank you very much. I'm delighted to um, be on the program and look forward to the discussion. Sure. So let's start off with a sort of a basic overarching question. Um, discussion over Australian foreign policy has been dominated over the US-China question. Some say we should choose one over the other. Instead of trying to balance both relationships. I know your government took the Asia first, but not Asia only approach. What are your thoughts that we have to um, choose either the US or the China, or China in terms of balancing both? Well, the idea that uh, Australia should have to choose or it would be in our interest to choose between either the United States or China is a completely uh, absurd proposition. Uh, you should never make the mistake of uh, choosing between two countries, particularly uh, uh, in peacetime, and it's a ridiculous proposition. And those who propagate it are fascinated. I think they're bedazzled by the theory of international affairs which doesn't serve Australia's interests. Australia will always be closer to the United States than it is to China because we share common values. And values bind nations together more tightly than anything else. But China is hugely important to our country. Uh, it is our largest export destination. There are 1.3 million Australians who have Chinese heritage. Uh, Chinese, uh, which is the collective description of Mandarin and Cantonese, is the most widely spoken foreign language in Australia. And the links between uh, the two countries based on people to people uh, connections are very close. But having said that, uh, China is uh, a communist dictatorship. It's been so since 1949. Uh, it is a vastly different country when it comes to systems of government. And we have to understand that. And there's always the potential, therefore, for friction. And but what has happened over recent years is that China has taken a markedly more assertive and aggressive attitude internationally compared to what was the case some time ago. Now, that is a reason to um, reinforce uh, our outreach to China consistent with maintaining our values and certainly not to fall into the absurd uh, error of feeling we've got to choose China and the United States. So the premise of the first question relies on there being potential military conflict between both the US and China. Do you think that conflict between both countries is imminent in the near future or not? No, I don't think conflict between military conflict between China and the United States is imminent. I don't think it's uh, likely not in the foreseeable future anyway. Uh, China has no interest in a military conflict with the United States. However much people may be uh, overwhelmed by China's development and mesmerized by its gathering strength, 
uh, it's no match for the Americans militarily and we shouldn't lose sight of that. And there's nothing to be gained. China has gained an enormous amount by building her economy uh, and in the process has liberated hundreds of millions of people from poverty. So I think the likelihood of a military conflict between the two countries is very remote at the present time. <clears throat> so on the note of the US-Australia relationship, Anders, I know that was something very defining um, in your role as Prime Minister. Um, it's been a defining role of our foreign affairs ever since the Second World War. What do you think the future lies ahead for the alliance between Australia and the US? I think our relationship will remain very close. And the main reason it will remain close is that although we have uh, very different systems of democratic government, very different, uh, and they operate in, 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 in a completely different way, um, we are countries that share the common values of democracy, of uh, pursuit of individual liberty, of a belief in uh, the importance of the family, a belief uh, that people should be valued according to their contribution to society, not according to their racial or ethnic background or class or anything of that kind. Uh, we have a lot in common, although sometimes um, our sense of humour can be different and uh, Australians uh, and Americans can surprise themselves by uh, uh, that discovery. But um, our um, values are very similar. We are both, of course, federations where states uh, have a lot of authority. Uh, the history of America in that regard, of course, is very different. America fought a civil war uh, over state power. We've, we, we have never done that. And although we've had a few arguments about opening and closing borders during the pandemic, that is child's play uh, to uh, the sort of disputes between states that occurred years ago in the United States. And in all of these things, you've got to keep a sense of perspective. Um, we're very fortunate in Australia that we have a federation that with all its imperfections has worked very well. But I'm very optimistic about the future of the relationship between the United States and Australia. We, of course, are bound together by a common language that we sometimes find is less common than we might expect. But uh, fundamentally, it's a huge uh, blender of our two societies. If you speak the same language, it really makes an enormous difference. And on the note, on the note of similar values, um, one of your achievements as Prime Minister was finally um, signing the U.S. Free Trade Agreement um, in 2004. Um, in re one of the one of um, one thing that came out of that was the E3 visa, which many people actually aren't aware. Um, it's a work visa which only applies to nationals of Australians as well as their spouses and children. And it actually has put Australia in a rather envious position because a lot of other countries wanted this treatment as well from the US. This has obviously helped along with the US waiver program that Australians are entitled to in helping more um, Australians travel to the US. In terms of building a strong relationship between both countries, how important is that sort of bottom down people to people connection as a, in, in addition to the top uh, head of state to the head of state connection? US-Australia free trade agreement um, and that visa arrangement, which was a product of a particularly close relationship. And, and I'm very happy that Australians have access to that program. And I know um, it's regarded uh, with some degree of envy by other countries, but um, uh, Australia has been a very um, good friend and ally of the United States in difficult times. Uh, Although people talk a lot about the uh, the power of the United States and understandably the military power, the economic power, uh, a sense of vulnerability is something that often many Americans feel. And having a very loyal friend, uh, not an uncritical loyalty, but uh, a loyalty nonetheless is very important. And uh, Australia has certainly uh, qualified for that over the years. and. Uh, but those people-to-people -people links that study and travel 
and residents and I know so many Australians whose children have lived for periods of time in the United States, sometimes starting with study, coming back and then going back, working in business, working in the professions. Those sort of bonds are very important and uh, uh, anything that can be done reasonably to reinforce them between Australia and the United States should be encouraged. And then on the note of the FTA, now, at the time, there was a lot of criticism by people who said uh, that we were committing trade suicide for doing an FTA with a developed country. Um, that didn't turn out to be um, the truth, and the FTA did much better than people thought it would do. Why were people so cautious of the FTA back then? Oh, I think because of the, the history, the um, attitude, of, I suppose, the trade establishment in the United States was to say, you don't make free trade agreements with other than developing countries. You don't make them with uh, countries like Australia now. The uh, free trade agreement, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that was an exception, but that was because Canada and, uh, and Mexico were uh, landlocked with the United States. That is a special case and a special explanation. And, and that was the reason why that was regarded as an exception. But there was quite a bit of resistance, I know, in, in, inside what I loosely call the trade establishment in the United States, because this was seen as, as uh, uh, driven by uh, the politics, or the political intimacy uh, between Australia and the United States. Now, OK, to the extent that it may have been, well, um, I, don't, I didn't mind that. Um, because I saw the free trade agreement as being beneficial to both countries. I certainly saw it as beneficial to uh, Australia. Uh, but of course, there were areas where um, we couldn't get everything we wanted because it was affecting the vital interest of the United States. I remember the final discussion I had with President Bush uh, about uh, some of the sensitive areas such as sugar. Uh, uh, he said, John, you've got to understand uh, that's an Im important domestic issue in my country as it is in yours. And I did understand that, although obviously I'd have liked a bit more movement. But uh, it was a very good agreement uh, from Australia's point of view. And, and, and uh, it, it, it symbolised a particularly warm association, as well as providing a lot of practical benefits, some of which we've alluded to. Sure. And on the note of the connection between heads of state and presidents, um, how important um, is that connection between other heads of state in terms of developing the bilateral relationship, not just with the US, but any other country? Well, <clears throat> let me say of the American-Australian relationship, it's one of those relationships that is bigger and goes beyond uh, who happens to be in the lodge in Canberra or in the White House in Washington. Uh, and it can cross the party political divide. I mean, probably the uh, the most controversial foreign policy issue that the United States um, has faced in the last 50 or 60 years was the Vietnam War, and Australia was uh, participated. We contributed troops to fight alongside the Americans in the Vietnam War, and we felt not as... Uh, severely, but nonetheless felt very keenly within our own country that um, it was a very controversial issue. Now, at that time, the administration in the United States was what is loosely called a centre-left administration. The Americans call it liberal, which is confusing to a lot of uh, Australians, but I think your audience understands what I'm talking about. Uh, and, uh, President, the commitment to Vietnam, the, uh, the irreversible commitment, was really made under the Kennedy administration, and then it was reinforced uh, very heavily by Lyndon Johnson. And they were both Democrats, centre left, but the uh, administration that was in power in Australia at the time was the centre right administration. Initially, when the commitment of a combat battalion was made, uh, by Australia. The Prime Minister was um, uh, Sir Robert Menzies, and then he retired and he was replaced by Harold Holt, same party, centre-right. The point I'm making is that the fact that you had 
<clears throat> centre left in Washington and centre right in, in Australia didn't make any real difference. And equally, uh, although the circumstances were different, uh, I know that um, uh, during the period of the Hawke government, the Labor government was in power uh, in Canberra. There were good relations between the then Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, and uh, uh, Ronald Reagan for a period of time, and then 41, as he's called, George H.W. Bush. There you had a centre-right in the United States, centre-left in Australia. Now, I just go into that detail to make the point that it's one of those relationships that transcends political differences. But having said that, <clears throat> it always helps if you have a good relationship between the heads of, of, of government. I mean, I had dealt with President Clinton for four and a half years and then with President George W. Bush for seven and a half years. And I had very good relations with both of them. I think it's fair to say that I, at a personal level, became somewhat closer to President Bush uh, than President Clinton. But I had a very good relationship with President Clinton. I respected his intelligence. He was very committed to the alliance. I found him a good person to deal with who understood Australia's interests. Uh, and um, uh, it just reminded me of just how valuable, if you can establish a good personal rapport, how valuable that can become. So yeah, that leads me on to my next question. I think you've covered it mostly for the US relationship in the sense that it goes beyond the personal um, parties of the, both the heads of states. But in regards to other countries in your experience, did you feel that being from a similar side of politics, say, for example, if it was Conservative in the UK and the Liberal Party here, or if it was Labour in Australia and Labour in New Zealand, outside the US for other countries, is being from a similar um, side of the divide help in regards to building that relationship? Well, it, my experience, you mentioned Britain and, and New Zealand. It so happened that for most of the time that I was um, Prime Minister of Australia, except for the first few months, I was dealing with the Labor Prime Minister in Britain. Uh, for the whole of the time I was Prime Minister, uh, Tony Blair was Prime Minister of Britain, uh, I was Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, and then for a period at the end, Gordon Brown took over. And equally, for most of the time that I was Prime Minister of Australia, not quite as long as in case with Britain, uh, there was a Labor Prime Minister in New Zealand, in first of Helen Clark. Now, I had very good relations with both Tony Blair and Helen Clark. Uh, I think it's fair to say that on a lot of issues, Helen Clark's attitudes and mine were a bit further apart uh, than Tony Blair's and mine, but it didn't interfere with the relationship. And, and I, I enjoyed dealing with her a great deal. She was uh, very mindful of how important the ANZAC relationship is, and both of us were resolved to make it work. And of course, I, I developed a a, a very close working relationship with Tony Blair. Uh, it was covered a period of 11 years and, and joint participation, our two countries in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and we have a common world view of a lot of things. Um, now, would it have been a little different um, if there had been a conservative leader in Britain? Well, uh, uh, I think in some areas, uh, we'd have agreed a bit more, but the, the reality is that when you get to an international level and you're dealing with somebody who values the bilateral relationship, um, party political differences become less important uh, as they should. Now, I know Boris Johnson very well because I'm now out some years removed from power and Scott Morrison is dealing with him, but uh, and I, as Prime Minister, I continue to have dealings with the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, and uh, he's, a, he's a very, um, he, he waged a very effective campaign on Brexit. I have to say I agreed with his position on Brexit, uh, which um, uh, certainly wasn't the attitude taken by some of his Conservative predecessors or by Tony Blair, who had a different view. But um, that's been resolved uh, as far as membership is concerned. But when you get to the head of government level, the most important thing uh, 
is is to keep a focus on the interests of your own country and the bilateral relationship and political party differences uh, are less uh, consequential at a head of government level. Sure. And you raised a good point of coming in. Um, you were there when Tony Blair was in office and Bill Clinton. And that sort of gets me to my next point is when you came into office in 1996, um, you came in during the sort of the phase and what was known as the third wave. So for those of you who don't know, so our traditional left-leaning parties reassessed themselves and approached a more centrist and use economic social policies from the right in order to become more appealing. Um, so we saw this to some extent in the Hawke Keating government, which was there before you um, came into power as prime minister. President Clinton used this in the new Democrats pledge to come into power. Similar, Tony Blair, 97, helped to come into power under the new Labour. What was it like um, when you came into office and then there was this th third wave movement around the world? And how did that impact foreign affairs for Australia? It didn't really have any impact because um, a lot of what you call the third wave, a lot of the um, references you've made are more to domestic policy uh, rather than international policy. And uh, there wasn't a lot of difference between my attitude to fighting terrorism and Tony Blair's attitude to fighting terrorism or indeed um, differences between Tony Blair and George W. Bush, they were very similar. Um, and although there was, there were some differences between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration uh, on some of the major foreign policy, policy issues America faced, they weren't all that great. And uh, when you read into the history of the, the Clinton years, uh, uh, the attitude that was taken towards many foreign policy issues was not all that dissimilar from the attitude taken by the Bush government and, of course, uh, the Bush administration. And, of course, when um, uh, Tony Blair decided to commit uh, some tens of thousands of British troops to the military operation in Iraq, it was very controversial in his country and it was extremely controversial within his own party. And he would never have got the support of the House of Commons to make that commitment if it hadn't been for the support of the Conservative Party in opposition, something that's forgotten. And he owes them uh, quite a lot in relation to that. Um, I know during your time in office, you had a preference for bilateralism versus multilateralism. Could you just explain what are some of the benefits in terms of pursuing foreign policy through bilateralism as opposed to multilateralism? I'm not against multilateralism. I just don't believe it should be um, given priority over bilateralism. I think of Australia's relations with, um, let me name three or four countries in Asia, with China, India, Indonesia, and um, Thailand. Now you have three, you have two, the two most populous countries in the world, you have the country with the largest Muslim population in the world in, in Indonesia. Uh, now, the only way that Australia could, could build and maintain good relations with those three countries uh, is to do it on a bilateral basis. It doesn't mean we shouldn't cooperate through APEC. Australia and India and Australia and Japan that had to be dealt with that little. And I felt that uh, we achieved better outcomes by focusing on those bilateral um, aspects, hand in glove with working with multilateral institutions, but not allowing multilateralism to govern the bilateral links between Australia and other countries. I know one of the successes of your government was a successful use um, of the UN-led um, peacekeeping force to East Timor in, in assisting with independence. Were there times where you found bodies like the UN and ASEAN helpful in advancing Australia's interest? Well, what was so successful about that was that we had <clears throat> a United Nations mandate, which is an illustration of multilateralism, but at a bilateral level, Australia was able to uh, engage the participation and assistance 
uh, of a wide range of countries in our region, countries such as such as Korea and Thailand, so that it wasn't seen as a Western European intervention in an Asian country, but was seen as a regional involvement. Um, uh, and the regional contribution was put together uh, at a bilateral level and it involved my personally approaching the heads of government uh, of other regions in the region and asking for their participation. Although we had a UN mandate, the actual uh, legwork, if I can put it that way, uh, of getting the involvement of other countries was undertaken by the Australian government. It was a good example of, of you might say, bilateralism working with multilateralism. Yeah, um, really good pragmatic approach. And I know you had a really good relationship with then President Cecilia Bambang Yudiono. Um, you were there, You, I think you mentioned before how Australia had the largest amount um, in quantity and in percentage of aid after the 2004 tsunami and the relationships you built with Indonesia were very strong. But at the same time, during the East Timor crisis, Australia-Indonesia relations did take um, a bit of a hit. How did you go from that period to building really good relationships with Indonesia? How did you go about mending the relationship so well? Well, I think there was, after the uh, difficulties involved in in the Interfet um, uh, intervention, and it was inevitable that that would put a strain on the relationship. But I think in a fairly quick period of time, um, the loss uh, of East Timor was accepted uh, by the Indonesians. And of course, Australia not only uh, later on gave a lot of help in the wake of the tsunami, but we also provided a lot of economic assistance to Indonesia at the time of the Asian financial meltdown. And, and that was remembered. The relationship with Indonesia is always challenging for Australia because although we're very near neighbours, we're very different societies. Indonesia is a much more populous country. Uh, it's a developing country. Uh, its culture and religion and its background is very different from that of Australia. And there are always going to be tensions, but fundamentally, Australia has always been seen as sympathetic to the aspirations of the Indonesian state. You must remember that way back um, when Indonesia was uh, seeking independence from the Dutch, the Australian government of the time was quite sympathetic to the aspirations uh, of the Indonesian people. And although there was a lot of debate and so forth, they were. And I think those things have contributed uh, very greatly and we've had good educational links but it's a relationship that needs um, a lot of maintenance and a lot of care and that really brings me back to my central point that there are peculiarities in that relationship that can only be accommodated in a bilateral framework and, and there has to be a deep understanding of the history between the two countries to get the right results. Uh, I often think when I'm talking about the region in which Australia lives that the outstanding figure, uh, I, I guess, of my lifetime in that part of the world has been Lee Kuan Yew, uh, the late Prime Minister of Singapore. And most people would regard him as being the great elder statesman uh, of Asia. Now, Lee Kuan Yew is a wonderful example of the power of the nation state in Singapore began its separate existence in, in very difficult circumstances that effectively was pushed out of the Malaysian Federation in the, the early to middle 1960s and it built a very powerful, effective, influential country uh, from then on. And to me, Lee Kuan Yew's leadership of Singapore and the success of the Singaporean state was an exemplar uh, of the power of the nation state. Small nation, very small population, no natural resources that was able to exert an enormous amount of influence. Now, great leadership, 
not everything that he did people would have agreed with and um but the point is that singapore has succeeded and has to use that old expression punched well above its weight for a long period of time and you raise a good point of the advantages of bilateral relationships and the last thing that on this point take me to the last question in our foreign affairs section um britain i know a country very close to you with Brexit now in a free trade agreement between both Australia and the UK, and the UK wanting to work more with Australia as part of the global Britain approach, do you think UK-Britain ties can get anywhere back to the significance it once shared? No, I, don't, I think we have to be realistic about the relationship with Britain. I mean, I'm, I am very um, supportive of the British institutions that Australia inherited. I think one of the great things uh, about Australia is we picked all the good bits of our British inheritance, the rule of law, parliamentary <coughs> democracy, a free media, all of those things, and they're very valuable, and we should always acknowledge our debt to the British for that. Uh, but there are aspects of, of, of Britain that we didn't inherit. I mean, uh, we've never had a class-driven society uh, or an aristocracy because we decided that that wasn't suitable in Australia. So I'll always have a you know, special regard for the British contribution to Australia. But as far as trade is concerned, things change fundamentally uh, when when the British joined the then common market uh, in the early 1970s. And um, you can't go back to that because uh, that was built on uh, the Ottawa Agreement, uh, which gave imperial preference. It was built very much on preferential access to British markets for uh, agriculture. Now, that's gone. Uh, it's been replaced, though, by a world in which we uh, export very heavily to countries such as China and, and Japan and, and Korea and I increasingly India. Uh, now, but there are other areas where, of course, the cooperation between Australia and the United Kingdom has continued and can expand. And I think we can pick up um, uh, a lot of uh, added value in that relationship, uh, perhaps in the services area uh, as well as other areas. But I don't think it should be a question of looking backwards. It's a question of looking forward and finding areas where post-Brexit, Australia and the United Kingdom can get together more. And, and the, the key thing is that Britain can now negotiate on her own a trade agreement. They haven't done that for 40 years. And one of the first things the British discovered when they voted to leave, correctly in my view, Brexit, leave Europe, was that they had, no, they had no capacity within their bureaucracy to negotiate a trade agreement because all most of the negotiation had been done by the European Union bureaucracy. Now, I think they will find uh, the liberation that Brexit has given them uh, a great opportunity to expand. Uh, but I think it's we have to build the trading relationship. The, the cultural and historical relationship has been largely, in my view, left un, unimpaired by, the, by Britain's membership of the European Union, although I think there were stresses and strains developing. But that's always been there, but in the trade, on the trade front, we've got to look at the future. We look at new opportunities rather than looking at it in terms of, or can we go back? Because you can't go back. Apart sure. from anything else we have made, you know, we've we developed very strong links with uh, our trading partners in our own region, and they're very valuable. And and the complementarity between the capacity of Australia to export something like iron ore. Uh, to China uh, or, or Japan is enormous. Now, I know there are issues in that relationship at the present time, which we have alluded to, but uh, I think as far as Britain is concerned, let's look forward to what the opportunities might be. Sure, bright roads ahead. Um, and now we're moving on to sports diplomacy. I know you're a big sports fan and during your time in office, you'd always make time to attend major Australian sporting events. Uh, one thing that stood out for me when reading your book, Lazarus Rising, was that former captain Mark Taylor once called you a cricket tragic. He uh, did. Um, how important a factor is sports as a tool for a country like Australia and helping us to bring us close to other countries? 
Well, there's no doubt that um, sport is part of the national cement of Australia, although um, you, you would sometimes wonder when you think of the fact that we've got 25 million people and uh, we have um, uh, four football codes. We have Australian rules and we have uh, what I still refuse to call anything other than soccer uh, and uh, rugby league and rugby union. Um, now, and then of course, at a national level, uh, we have cricket. Now, how important, I, I, I think <clears throat> those links have been invaluable, even though there's ferocious competition. And when you think of the history of cricket and think of the um, the body line series, there's nobody virtually alive now that would remember that. But uh, and 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 the the ferocious competition between Australia and England in cricket, you you wonder whether that's not putting a strain on the relationship in a peculiar sort of way. It 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 illustrates how strong the relationship is that you can have such intense, uh, almost visceral rivalry between. Uh, two countries that have so much in common. But what binds them together, of course, is the uh, is a love of a common game. And of course, uh, anybody who knows anything about the Indian subcontinent uh, knows uh, just how uh, wonderful uh, is, is is the binding effect of cricket on, on India, on, on Pakistan, and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And uh, I think those bonds are very important, and it's fair to say that the names of of uh, of Bradman and Border and uh, uh, War uh, and uh, Gilchrist uh, and Taylor uh, are better known in the Indian subcontinent than just about any other Australian names, and uh, I think that that's a good thing. There's obviously a role for a country such as Australia in assisting. Um, countries that are poorer than, than than we are in developing the sports that we have in common. And that's something that we as a nation should always keep in mind. But uh, I, I think of the special affection that the West Indies um, uh, still holds in the hearts of many Australian cricket followers. And many people of my age would, would, would say that the greatest test series that was ever played in Australia was played in 1960-61 when when we had a tied test Brisbane it was a wonderful West Indian cricket team now the West Indies are not doing as well now but that's a small group of islands that uh, are, are better known um, to uh, Australia and Australian sports followers than many uh, other countries with much larger populations and that's just an illustration of how valuable those links are and and of course, the, if, if you go to some of the individual sports, the, although the team sports in the United States, uh, uh, basketball, of course, has a, a gathering, a going following in Australia, but it still hasn't got anywhere near the, uh, the national notoriety of the other great team sports in Australia. You think of the individuals, of, of golf players, of tennis players and the like, uh, Americans who are so well known uh, in Australia amongst the followers of those sports. And that is a reminder of, once again, of how those links can keep people together. Um, and uh, I think we should we should build on those, uh, uh, recognizing that um, uh, there's a limit. Um, in the end, you have to find uh, pragmatic areas of agreement. Uh, and development and economic growth between countries. But sport is a wonderful uh, cement, uh, not only within a country, but also between countries. And uh, it's something that I always tried to encourage when I was prime minister. And I always tried to respect the sporting background and the sporting traditions and heritage of countries. And it's wonderful to see the the emergence of countries in certain sports where you would not normally have associated them with them think of a country such as japan 40 years ago you wouldn't have associated japan with uh, rugby union uh, but uh, japan hosted the last world cup and and uh, one of the 
Japanese prime ministers, uh, Mr. Mori, with whom uh, I dealt with briefly uh, in the time I was prime minister. He played rugby union uh, and and you now have Bill Clinton heavy Clinton involvement as well. Big pardon? Bill Clinton also played rugby for Oxford as well. Uh, well, so. Bill Clinton and George Bush both played rugby. Um, uh, I think George Bush played it at it was at, at, at university briefly, and Bill Clinton, of course, being a Rhodes Scholar, he went to Oxford and he played it uh, at university. But I, I don't know that he retained uh, the same uh, post-Oxford involvement in it as Mr. Morey had. In But it's just an illustration of how uh, interesting uh, observation of how a country can acquire an interest in a sport that it hadn't previously been associated with. Um, you were also Prime Minister during the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Um, how important a moment was this from a, for a soft power, from a soft power, sorry, second. You were Prime Minister during the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Um, how important a moment was this from a soft power initiative from Australia's point of view? Um, how key was this in sort of promoting brand Australia to the world and helping with tourism? Well, it was, a, it was invaluable. Uh, it, it, it displayed Australia at her very best. And, and I remember attending an APEC meeting in um, just two or three months after the Olympics and talking to the leaders of the other economies in APEC, the principal discussion was how well the Olympics had gone and how impressed they had all been with the way in which Australia handled it. Not only was it superbly organised in a in a technical sense with the staging of events, but the volunteers, the open egalitarian character of the welcome that was extended to people, not only the athletes, but others that came from all around the world. It, it, it displayed Australia at her very best. We're very good at running international sporting events because we've got a sufficiently affluent population to buy the tickets to attend the events to make it an economic success and the classless egalitarian nature of our society means that people are made from other countries are made very welcome away from the sporting arena very, very important they feel safe as well now nobody could no nobody can feel mm, Totally safe, I suppose, anywhere, but compared with most other societies, it's a very safe country as well. So I thought <clears throat> the 2000 Olympics was was a huge uh, demonstration of the strength of Australia. And you raised a good point about the APEC meeting, and that's one of the benefits of sports diplomacy is that during these major sporting events, you have various heads of states coming to one city or one country to support their team. Did you ever find during a time in office that during a sporting event, whether in Australia or overseas, you were able to double up and meet other heads of states and get business done? Was it an effective way? Um, occasionally, but I can't think of any outstanding example of that because I didn't. Um, it, it, it depended very much on where I might by happenstance be at a time, but uh, I never, much and all as I liked, going to international sporting events, if I could, if I happened to be in the country, there had to be a, a trigger, there had to be a reason why I was in the country in the first place. But um, the, the important thing is that when a country such as Australia has an opportunity of hosting an international event, it, it uses that to demonstrate its soft power by not only making a the great success of the event sporting wise, but also making people who are involved feel very welcome. And that is something that we were able to do with the 2000 Olympics. We were able to do with the 2003 Rugby World Cup. Uh, and that's a very big event. It's, uh, I think, number three after the Olympics and the Soccer World Cup, uh, because there are a lot of countries now that are involved in that. So we are very, very good at those events. and. Uh, I, I just hope in the years to come we continue to demonstrate that to the rest of the world. And on a light note, to end the fi um, for the final question, what was your favourite um, Australian sporting memory as Prime Minister? Oh, I think probably watching um, 
Australia win the Rugby World Cup in 1999. Uh, I was in a very good mood because uh, we'd had the referendum on whether or not Australia should become a republic during that weekend and the side that I was supporting won. Uh, and but uh, I thought that was a great achievement by Australia uh, to win that rugby. I mean, I had many other. I I, I think uh, in in cricket it's very very hard. I I wasn't present at the rugby much. I was watching television, but I watched uh, that wonderful century that Steve War scored in Sydney in Sydney in his final uh, one of his final appearances. And but. Um, that rugby event really stood out. Sure. And on that note, Mr. Howard, thank you so much for being generous with your time. Uh, it's been a good reflection on your time in office. Your experience and contributions are very valid to the discussion, and it was great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.